For generations, Western historians painted Polynesians as lucky castaways, courageous perhaps, but ultimately accidental adventurers blown by storms onto paradise. You know the image, half-naked islanders clinging to driftwood, smiling under palm trees, with no idea how they got there. It's romantic. It's also wildly wrong. Because here's the real headline. They didn't drift. They designed. Modern archaeology and genetics have ripped that old map to shreds. The people who settled the farthest islands on Earth, from Hawaii to Easter Island to Aotearoa, were not guessing. They were master navigators who crossed an ocean that makes the Atlantic look like a pond. We're talking about more than 10 million square miles of open water, explored without compasses, sextants, or steel. And they did it thousands of years before Columbus ever touched a rudder. This wasn't luck. It was legacy. These voyagers didn't just stumble upon land masses. They engineered floating civilizations that could replicate themselves. Canoes weren't escape pods. They were mobile ecosystems. Every vessel carried not just people, but pigs, dogs, chickens, taro roots, yam cuttings, breadfruit saplings, even soil microbes. It's like they looked at the ocean and said, why not bring the farm with us? And they did all this while your average medieval European thought the edge of the earth was a cliff. But perhaps the most stunning discovery comes not from pottery or petroglyphs, but from DNA. Inside the cells of modern Polynesians lies a genetic breadcrumb trail stretching thousands of years and thousands of miles. Their bodies are living archives of one of the most audacious human journeys ever undertaken. So if they didn't drift, then where did they come from? And how did their genes, their language, their crops, and their memory make it across the world's largest ocean? To answer that, we need to go back. Way back. To a place where the sea didn't start as home. It started as a threat. To highland rice farms, drowned coastlines, and the first whispers of a people who chose to sail rather than sink. Long before they sailed the Pacific, the ancestors of the Polynesians stood on solid ground, quite literally. Around 6,000 years ago, in the green highlands and fertile river valleys of ancient Taiwan, small agricultural communities were thriving. These were Neolithic farmers, cultivating rice and millet, raising pigs and dogs, crafting pottery, and living simple, rooted lives. Then the sea rose. During a climatic phase known as the Holocene Climate Optimum, melting glaciers pushed coastlines inland. Salt water crept into villages. Fields flooded. Homes vanished beneath the waves. The land that once fed them turned to ocean. But here's where the story veers from tragedy to transformation. These communities didn't wither. They innovated. They took their farming knowledge and married it with something bold. Boats. Not just rafts. Purpose-built canoes, capable of holding not only families, but food, tools, and the seeds of civilization itself. And they didn't simply float off into the blue. They moved strategically, island by island, stopping at what we now call the Batanes Islands a small but crucial stepping stone between Taiwan and the Philippines. There, archaeology gives us the first whispers of something big. Obsidian tools, pig bones, and early red-slipped pottery, all pointing to a migration with purpose. Eventually, they pushed farther, into island Southeast Asia and beyond. But something remarkable happened along the way. Around 3,000 years ago, a cultural engine revved to life, Lapita culture. Named after a site in New Caledonia, Lapita was more than a style of pottery. It was a portable blueprint for human settlement, 
a kit that included farming, seafaring, animal husbandry, and social structure. It was civilization, boxed and ready for export. DNA recovered from Lapita burial sites in Vanuatu and Tonga revealed something striking. The earliest individuals carried nearly 100% East Asian ancestry. In other words, the first wave of seafarers didn't slowly mix with others as they went. They moved fast, with precision, before contact could blur the genetic map. This wasn't a panicked flight from disaster. It was a deliberate act of biological and cultural engineering. They didn't just bring life with them. They brought the instructions for how to recreate it. But as they ventured farther across the ocean, something strange began to happen. They began to change, not just in culture, but deep within their genes. As the voyagers moved deeper into the Pacific, something began to shift not just in their geography, but in their biology. The earliest Lapita settlers, those who first crossed into remote Oceania, carried DNA that was almost entirely East Asian. Their genome was like a time capsule from Taiwan, unblended, untouched. But when archaeologists and geneticists started analyzing the DNA of their descendants further into the Pacific places, like Fiji, the Solomons, and Samoa something surprising appeared. They were no longer purely East Asian. Modern genome-wide studies revealed a curious pattern, a gender-biased genetic mixture. The mitochondrial DNA, the kind passed down from mothers, remained largely East Asian, but the Y chromosomes transmitted from fathers were increasingly Melanesian. In simpler terms, the women came from the boats, the men came from the islands. This wasn't random. It was a pattern, repeated over centuries, pointing to something very human. Encounters between incoming Lapita settlers and local Melanesian populations. Whether through trade, alliance, integration, or less consensual means, Polynesian ancestors absorbed Melanesian men into their lineage. This blend wasn't just cultural, it had lasting genetic consequences. As time passed, certain lineages vanished entirely. Some of the early Lapita Y DNA lines no longer exist in modern Polynesians. Why? Two forces well known to geneticists, bottlenecks and founder effects. When small populations settle new islands, only a narrow slice of genetic variation survives. If no one in the canoe carried a particular lineage, it died with the mainland. But survival wasn't just about who got on the boat. It was about what their genes could endure. Life on remote islands imposed brutal evolutionary pressures, scarce resources, long voyages, shifting ecosystems. Over time, natural selection honed a new kind of Polynesian genome Genes that helped digest starchy root crops like taro and yams became widespread. Mutations that improved resistance to parasites or enhanced water and salt retention gained favor. In some cases, islanders adapted to survive on diets with minimal protein and low iodine, avoiding conditions like goiter or wasting. The ocean wasn't just a highway, it was a crucible. These weren't the same people who had left Taiwan. The Pacific didn't just test their canoes, it tested their chromosomes. So when we talk about Polynesians as navigators, it's not just a cultural label. They became a people genetically sculpted by sailing. But perhaps the most astonishing feat of their voyage wasn't just how far they went, but where they went next. Thousands of miles from their homeland, Across a hostile and seemingly endless ocean, they found something strange. A plant, a word, and a genetic clue that would flip the script on everything we thought we knew. It was just a root. Humble, knobby, brown. But it carried a secret that would take centuries to decode. When European explorers first arrived in Polynesia, 
they found sweet potatoes thriving in island gardens, cultivated with care and embedded in local diets and ceremonies. Polynesians called it kumara, a word strikingly similar to kumal or kumal in the Quechua and Aymara languages of the Andes in South America. Coincidence? Maybe. Except for one problem. Sweet potatoes don't float. Botanically speaking, Ipomoea batatas rots quickly in seawater. There's no plausible natural way it could drift across the Pacific unaided. And yet, there it was, growing across Polynesia long before any Spanish galleons even set sail. For decades, this was treated as a historical oddity, a botanical anomaly without a narrative. But then, in 2020, a study published in Nature shattered the silence. Geneticists found traces of Native American DNA in the genomes of modern Polynesians from the Marquesas Islands, dated to around 1200 AD, several centuries before European contact. This wasn't folklore. It was a genomic footprint, hard-coded into the blood. But here's the twist. The contact didn't happen on Easter Island, the Polynesian outpost closest to South America. It likely occurred farther west, in the Marquesas or Tuamotu archipelagos. That means the Polynesians didn't just drift to South America. They voyaged there and returned with seeds and stories and apparently people. Because the exchange wasn't just agricultural, some coastal Polynesian bark cloth designs and petroglyph motifs bear striking resemblance to Andean patterns. Linguists, too, point to faint echoes between Polynesian and South American terms for certain plants and tools. This wasn't a random encounter. It was a brief, deliberate meeting of two hemispheres, brokered not by conquistadors or caravels, but by canoes. And in those canoes sat navigators who had already conquered one ocean and were curious enough to face another. Sweet potatoes became a staple crop in Polynesia. In places like New Zealand, they formed the backbone of Maori agriculture, helping communities survive in colder climates at the edge of the Polynesian world. So yes, it was just a route, but it crossed the impossible. And it proved one thing. The boundaries we drew on maps were never the boundaries they saw. They had no compass, no sextant, no maps inked on parchment. And yet, Polynesian voyagers sailed across an ocean so vast it could swallow Europe whole, with a level of precision that still baffles scientists today. So how did they do it? Their instruments were stars, swells, clouds, and birds. They observed the rising and setting points of specific stars on the horizon, using them like fixed coordinates to chart courses between islands. They read the rhythm of ocean swells, which travel in distinct directions depending on distant wind systems. They watched how seabirds left and returned to land at predictable times of day. Even the color and shape of cloud formations gave away the presence of land beyond the visible horizon. It was a system of clues, all encoded in nature. But the real magic wasn't just observation, it was memory. Polynesian navigation was passed down not through textbooks, but through chants, long poetic recitations that embedded roots, currents, and celestial alignments into rhythm and rhyme. These chants were performed in ritual, learned from master to apprentice, and sometimes accompanied by hand gestures, body positioning, or rehearsal under the night sky. In a very literal sense, the map lived in their bodies. Modern experiments using GPS have confirmed the accuracy of this method. In some cases, navigators trained in traditional techniques have achieved route accuracy exceeding 85 to 90 percent, matching or surpassing that of early European explorers with tools. But then, the sky changed. Around 1300 AD, 
the Pacific began to cool during a period known as the Little Ice Age. Trade winds shifted. Weather became erratic. In some island chains, sailing routes that had once been reliable grew treacherous. Crops failed. Populations declined. And with crisis came contraction. Polynesian societies became more inward-looking. Navigational knowledge once celebrated and shared grew sacred, restricted to a few high-ranking navigators or priestly lineages. And as generations passed, voyages ceased. Not because they forgot, but because remembering became dangerous. They didn't lose their knowledge. They buried it in the minds of the last who could sing it. Today, much of that oral navigation system has been lost, but one kind of memory never disappeared because it was never taught, never spoken, and never sung. It was written in blood. Centuries have passed since the last great Polynesian voyages. The chants have faded, the roots forgotten, the stars still shine, but fewer know how to read them. And yet, the ocean still speaks through DNA. Modern Polynesians carry within them fragments of the journey, genetic echoes from Taiwan's early farmers, Melanesian islanders, and even the indigenous peoples of South America. Each chromosome a chapter, each mutation a map. What we once saw as isolated islands are now revealed to be genetic stepping stones scattered across time, from rice fields in Taiwan to volcanic outcrops in Fiji, from the high Andes to the far edge of New Zealand, and in between, a thread, unbroken, pulled tight by survival. The journey wasn't linear, it was layered. A single root crop, the sweet potato, speaks of ancient contact across the world's widest sea. A change in the shape of a Y chromosome reveals alliances formed on distant shores. And a rare gene for digesting starch tells of a people who made famine survivable with little more than taro and faith. This isn't mythology, it's biology. But told like a song only your cells can sing. Their bodies were the ships, their genes, the journals. Their memory didn't vanish, it evolved. We often say history is written by the victors, but for the Polynesians, history was written in motion, not on monuments or scrolls, but in the salt of their sweat, in the soil they carried, and in the children they raised on distant shores. Their world wasn't mapped by borders, but by possibility. And so we're left with one final question. If DNA can remember stories the world forgot, have we truly listened to what our own blood is still trying to tell us?